So before this interview, we'd love to hear more about your childhood, if you if you could share for you. Yeah, so I grew up in a small town in Hillsburg. I was born and raised there. Um, I'm the middle child of uh, uh, four brothers. Uh, lived in Hillsburg most of my life. Grew up. Had a pretty good childhood. Um, you know, my mom and my dad they like argued a lot, a lot of violence. Uh, my dad was big into drinking. My mom wasn't. Um, I caught on to that scene, that a uh, little bit of that abuse on the way, uh, like my dad treated my mom. I wasn't really going for it. You witnessed some of that? Yeah, I witnessed you were a kid? it, seen it and all. Seen the abuse, didn't really get, like see it, see, seen how the angerness that my dad had for whatever reason would punch things, anger. And then uh, it really hit me when uh, I was young, five years old, my dad came in and uh, just just said he was gonna leave. He just walked out, uh, didn't see him, none of us knew. It hit me real hard, being the middle child, really messed me up, just not knowing, you know And I mean? I was real close to my mom, always was a mommy's uh, boy, but you know, it really hit me hard, um, you know, growing up not with that, having a father. I mean, I did pretty good in school, but uh, little by little, it, it took a toll, you know, like through junior high, I'd be getting into trouble um had to go to like psychology yeah you know um talk to people my mom just didn't know why you know she tried to do everything she could to provide let me play sports have a good life you know on top of my other uh, brothers but she just knew something was with me as the middle child and uh it just led on to like pretty good life for me i was able to make it through junior high and then when i got into high school um uh, it was just i finally got to play sports football, um, something that my other brothers didn't get to play. But then it led into um, major effect. I started getting into the partying a lot. We did a lot of partying at our house. My mom was always gone. So my family wasn't really around too much. My mom would vacation a lot. My dad wasn't around. I didn't hear from my dad for a while until he made a phone call telling me, telling us that he was with a new woman, um, soon to be my stepmom, and he moved to Fairfield. I never knew anything about Fairfield, never even knew where it was. I grew up in Hillsburg, small town, grew up there my whole life, born at that hospital, Hillsburg Hospital, looked out. They said this was the home I was gonna live in and got to be blessed and lived in that home for 19 years. A lot of memories, but yeah, throughout, Throughout my, probably from high school all the way on to now, it just started drinking, getting into relationships. Um, I started seeing good and bads, like I had good qualities from my mom about a treat people the right way. But then I also took sides from my dad about control, uh, being abusive. Um, if somebody hurt me, I'd go hurt her more. So in relationships, I, I hurt a lot of people. Um, and I, I'd also start drinking heavily. Um, you know, back in those days, it wasn't really big. It was just uh, pretty much just taking pills, smoking weed and drinking. That was the biggest thing that was around. Um, where I grew up, I never really got into the other stuff until later down in my, my, my more out of high school. But um, it just led to, um, you know, I was doing good in school here and there until like my senior year, got into a big ass brawl at high school. Um, they jumped one of my friends over some color stuff. I, I pushed the issue to getting almost expe expelled. I had to do homeschool. And I took that as a celebration because I could just party and I just partied and celebrated and was really just upset. Um, you know, I didn't was going back and forth those times. Um, um, it was really tough on me because we would always have to drive almost an hour, two hours to go visit my dad. And I didn't really like that back and forth. Um, you know, it really took a toll on me. You know, I always believed in family staying together. So it really destroyed me and relationships, drug use. I just used all of that to like secure, like, hey, why is this happening? I knew at that age, I was like 18. I didn't know what I was doing. Took some classes at the Santa Rosa Cruz, but I didn't know where I was going, you know, with my life or whatever. I was still drinking, still smoking pot, but didn't do anything really else. Did some pills. A couple of times when I was young, one of my best friends walked into a party. I almost overdosed on pills. I just didn't care. Like when I was younger, I was like, you know, I, I I broke uh, broke mirrors. I had my mom walk in. Uh, she uh, used glass to cut my whole arm up. I got marks on my arm. 
almost took my life a few times when I was younger. Um, just said, just, just didn't know, like, did, um, you know, just didn't care, didn't like, just didn't feel love. Just a lot of d domestic stuff was going around, and it just it kept on bothering me. You know, never knew, never knew why my dad left. Never knew who was this. Just back and forth. You know, my dad would tell me stuff. My mom would tell me stuff, and it just took a toll on my life. You know, to making stupid decisions, getting in trouble, getting arrested. Uh, you know, committing crimes, stealing. Then it led to like, you know, um, the only option my mom had was like, hey, uh, well, maybe we'll take you to the job corps. So I went to the job corps. I was like, yeah, that's a cool little thing. I went through it. But, you know, I got clicked with the right, the, the, the Samoans and stuff like that. And I started running drugs. I started running, hey, like, hey, this is cool. You know, I can, on the weekends, I can go to California and I can bring the drugs into Nevada. So I started bringing in the drugs into Nevada. I started wanting to be feel like I was loved, but was loved by the wrong people. I started, hey, I can bring the drugs, dude. He, he, and they said, well, we'll protect you and different things like that. I can hold my own ground. So I was just selling drugs there, everything. And then unfortunately I did graduate from there. I was able to get a degree, but I still led and throughout my whole, like that was after I graduated to my mid teens. Where'd you 18, graduate 19, from? I graduated from Hillsburg High in 2005. And then I waited around from 18, a little bit on. And then my mom was able to get me into the Sierra Nevada Job Corps in Reno. I graduated there, uh, took me on and off, drank, got in trouble, um, got in trouble uh, smoking weed in the dorms. Um, then they, they raided us, but we knew the systems of what stuff to drink, so we were able to pass it. Um, then uh, they didn't know since somebody else covered it up. The person that snitched, I beat the hell out of them out on the streets. Um, and then they they covered it up because I knew if they do would have came back, I probably would have got kicked out. When life really sh took a big toll is when I got uh, moved into this other house in Fairfield and they started smoking crystal meth. And I never knew about this stuff. I was just used to just drinking alcohol, smoking pot, taking pills like normal people in Northern California. And then just being around it, I'm like, hey, this is just, well, what's wrong with this lifestyle? People are coming through people's windows, like people are doing this, that. Uh, people are coming up with these nice clothes, like what, what's this, you know, I wanna be part of this. So they started smoking it. I was like, hey, let me try this. And then I smoked the pilo and it just, it was just, it was on after that, I got high. And um, I just didn't think it was the right place for me. You know, I wanted something quicker, fast paced. So me and this one guy went up to San Francisco. He ended up leaving me there. And then that's when uh, life went downhill. I didn't get dis discreased, didn't really talk to my family. My family wasn't really happy with me. Started going downhill, started smoking crystal meth, got, uh, got around the wrong people. Started shooting meth. Um, a lot of things happened to me. Uh, I was sexually abused in San Francisco um, by some African American people. You know that really took a big, big toll on me. I was also devastated about a lot of relationships, heartbroken, family destruction, and I just, I just did everything I possibly could to just numb my body. And just every single day, I didn't want to live. I just kept on using as much drugs as I could, ripping people off. But there was always something in my heart always saying, hey, you know, there's people out there that love you and all. So I don't know, it was the grace of God that kept me alive. And then and uh, just kept on doing that lifestyle from 23 in San Francisco to 25. And then uh, I was on meth so long and I was living with this lady in uh, the projects and I made a phone call. Didn't even know that the people knew them, but they was living with the one guy that was doing dope and this, this other lady that was transgender. And they gave me a phone call. I made a phone call to this lady and uh, I met her and uh, she was an angel in my life. It was up 21 straight days. I, I still remember it. I was posing, sending pictures, thinking it, my abs were good when it, like all I was was a drug addict, you know, like a drug addict, lost, homeless, you know, confused, um, knowing that if I didn't end, if I didn't stop, this was gonna lead me to prison, death, a disease, killed, and I'm like, hey, it's really, I mean, as much as my family's been through, is this really the way she wants to see it? She's getting the phone call from my dad or whatever. And it wasn't, you know, so I just came to it. I made that phone call. And I guess that person always used to make up people because she was on drugs, made up like, hey, well, 
um, we got this guy that stays with us. His name's Duncan. Well, she kept on saying, hey, uh, Tatiana, the lady I met in San Mateo, became one of my first girlfriends. You know, she ended up saying, well, who was this guy? You know, he didn't sound well on the, the phone. He sounded like he was about to die. She's like, yeah, that's the one I keep on telling you about, Donkey, you know, and everything. He's like, but yeah, but, you know, I don't know what it is, but I got to come up there. And she seen me. She came up from the grace of God, like, you know, took a chance on me, let me into her apartment. I could have robbed her. I could have killed her. I could have done all of that, you know. But I took that as an angel. She looked at me, and then I just said, she says, I don't know you. And I said, I said, I don't know myself either right now. I just am high, and I feel like I'm going to die. And she heard that, and she heard my prayer, and I came. I came to San Mateo, and that's when I, I felt like it was going to be the beginning of a change of my life, getting out of San Francisco, but knowing I still had to go through there. So it took me a while. I wasn't able to do anything. I was so strung out. So it took me a while living with her, getting back into taking showers regularly, dishing, doing all those things, like, you know, so out of there, you know, it, it would take me like an hour just to wash a dish, you know. So at that time, I was getting off of the meth. It took me a while, and then that's when I felt like my body, little by little, was getting better. I was eating better. I was getting a little bit more. That's when I started feeling like, hey, uh, getting more of a confluence. That's when I started going out and applying for jobs. Things were going. And then that's when I started getting opportunities. I ended up was back and forth, like out, like, you know, still doing whatever I could to make money, you know, panhandling. You know, I wasn't really selling drugs or anything at that time. Was still, um, still was drinking and smoking pot, you know, um, but was off the meth. And, and I started seeing more of a change into my body. And then, then it just came down to, I got an opportunity finally. I was at the Safeway in San Mateo and this African-American lady offered me a job. She says, I, I don't know what it is about you but I might be in the right place because if you're just willing to take whatever, I got a job for you. And I was like, yeah, I mean, I'm desperate, you know, like I just need some kind of money. Like, then I told her a little bit of my story. If you don't profile, you know, I come from being on drugs. I said, I haven't done any math or anything. You know, I might smoke a little, you know, bud and, and drink. She's like, well, if you can just handle that, you can come. And, you know, she gave me an opportunity, a whole staff cl clothes. So I was excited. It was a little, small little door to open to a beginning of a new, because I was, I was out there bad. I've been off of meth since October 11th of 2012. So that's like 10 years, almost, yeah, 10, yeah, 10 years, and yeah. And then after all of that, you know, um, I knew I passed that, and that was a really, really hard addiction, because I never thought I'd get into hardcore drugs. But then it led to like, you know, when you keep your guard down, you think everything's good. So then I started getting real good at the WDS thing. So where everybody at Costco was paying attention. So the manager came in and said, hey, how about I sign you a deal, man? I'll pay you a little bit more. Come on to Costco. So I started coming on to Costco. It was cool. But then the pressure load got on me. And then I started leaning like Responsibility. Hey. Yeah. yeah, or responsibility, pressure led. And then I started making like a lot more money. And then that was my biggest issue is I loved money and I just craved it. And every time I had more money, I felt more money, more party and everything. So I started making bank. And I was like, oh, well, you know, I was at the age I could get alcohol, everything. So I started drinking. My drinking went off the wall. Like I wasn't using math or anything. That started really going off the wall um, to the point where it was damaging my relationship with Tatiana, she was really good to me and all. It led to me drinking, started stealing, started pulling licks at Costco um, to the point where I would have managers come in. They could never catch anything. We'd come in, don't you all right, dude? Like, it seems like you're coming in here and you're going to the bathroom, drinking. That led me to drinking, and then meeting the wrong people in Shoreview, to going back to selling drugs. Like I was selling crystal meth, I was selling cocaine. And then that's when it led into me um, walking away, just like leaving everything and just not even showing back up to Tatiana's house. Um, a really good woman that saved my life and was an angel to me. I just walked out. I walked out, went to the fair, got drunk at San Mateo County Fair with a couple guys, got drunk. And that's when I met another relationship. And uh, that's when I met uh, 
another relationship, Sharon, and uh, I was living in downtown San Mateo. She had an apartment, and between me and her, we just just party, dude. Like I'd work a lot. I was I was reliable too. I would go to work. It wouldn't matter drinking or being high, you know, on uh, cocaine. I would drive, be able to function. You know, I was able to drive the machines. No, no issue. You know, I'd just go in the bathroom while I was sick, throw up, throw some water on. Let's go. Let's do it. You know, and, you know, put some gum mouth. So it led to that, you know, some disagreements that I had with Tatiana, arguing or whatever, domestic violence charges. You know, I had to do some, a little bit of jail time. Then I left and I went with uh, Sharon. Sharon was all right for a while. She let me have a place, stayed there. But then it was the party. She drank, she drank heavily and I started drinking heavily. And it was just, um, it was in my blood. It was in my dad's blood. I was still hurt because I didn't get to see any of my family and all. I just used it on just drinking, disrespecting women, everything like that. And then it led to me drinking, pulling licks, doing all kinds of stuff. And then um, to the point where I was drinking, then I was using cocaine, um, smoking weed. And then it just led to me pulling too many licks to the point where they pulled me into the office and was like, hey, we have something on you. And, um, I didn't really want to discuss and, and snitch on myself. So I took the suspension, and then I knew after the suspension, next was gonna be, uh, there. there's the door. And then I just thought to myself, bam, dude, I just got off of meth, just started doing good, and now I'm back to square zero again. Um, and and then I was just, then I just looked at myself, and I had like, the, I still had all these bottles that are still, and it just it, it woken me because I was like, hey, well, you know, I already got off of meth. I was off of meth for a while, a few months I had under. And then I started looking at these bottles. And then I lost my job and I was just like, hey, well, you know, I could just drink these bottles of Jameson and just go. You know, I don't have to deal with no more pain, nothing. But it hit me. The light hit me. I was like, well, there's got to be a bitch here. You know, I just got fired from my job, I, you know. Um, I might not want to admit it, but I was committing crimes and these and this, they gave me a chance. Like, you know, and they, their biggest thing was, hey, if you want a chance back at this company, you have to get your life back together. It didn't sink into me. So it was like, I had to make decisions. I had to make changes. So it was like, you know, um, I had to start like, you know, I, I met with like a few of you guys, my higher power, started going to higher power and I had to make changes. I mean, was everything perfect? No, I had to like, I had to cut off, you know, Sharon I had to move. I was living in different places, but that's when it all started, you know, and then I started getting on a good road, staying in different places, um, you know, and have little here and there jobs, you know, but um, it was just pretty much, uh, that's my broken point. Like I went from using meth really out of control to thinking, oh, okay, I'm so good at it. Now I'm off of that. I can just drink a little bit, but then my drinking and cocaine use got really bad. I would only use cocaine only to keep me up because I was drinking to the bar till two in the morning. And the only thing that would keep me to be able to go to work at four o'clock in the morning was shoot and do some cocaine lines, <laughs> you know, to keep me up. So then I did that for a while, but I didn't like it. So it started bothering me. I started having health problems mm -hmm. really bad and with my anxiety, my breathing. I'm um, going to the hospital a lot, everything. So I just, it woken me up to the point after I lost the job, I had all these bottles, everything. I said, I'm just losing everything. You know, I just had everything and I'm losing everything. So I started I had to wake up. I started meeting people like Ricky Wade, Jacob, everything. Started learning about a, you know, about realizing that you have a problem, you know, cause I thought, hey, you know, I don't really have a problem. You know, I, I drink during the week, you know, and everything. I don't really you have thought you had it under control. Yeah, you know, I thought it was all right. You know, I'm still going to work. I'm not like stumbling into work and everything. I thought I was fine, but you know, I had a place to stay, everything. But it wasn't. You know, I was damaging my life. I didn't realize what I was damaging and I and and what what I could have been. Or like I'm thinking to myself, I don't care about myself. But that was being selfish because there's a lot of people out there that do care. Or what about those people that are out there? that could learn from my, my, my search. So I, it took me a while to realize that. Got connected with the right people, started going into the, the classes, going to higher power. That was the only one I really knew about. Then I started learning from like Ricky and everybody else, hey, don't worry about anything. I know you're really at the bottom, but look at the things that you're grateful for. You got a couple people you're able to stay with. So I took the steps of like, okay, 
I'm at the bottom, but I'm not completely back at the bottom. I had a place to stay. I had some clothes on my back and everything like that. But my biggest thing was just like through this program, which is go to meetings, 90 days, don't worry about nothing else. Took me a while to figure that out because, I mean, I was just always into the, like money, money, money. I got to make money. So there was times I was going to meetings or whatever. I wasn't using or anything, but I would still end up like, you know, selling drugs and everything. Still, I mean, I would quit the drinking, but I still smoke, you know, weed and everything. Then it just came to the point where I, I was like, okay, I can cut the meth. I can cut the cocaine. I cut the drinking. I was still smoking a little bit, but I guess it like helped helped me a little bit get my body back, like at least with the smoking the weed. So I wasn't doing it like it was addiction to me. But then it just led to like you know doing good. I ended up getting another job. I had that for a while. Was really really loving it. Was working real good with BJ's. The manager really supported me about my recovery. I had a lot of time under me. So he would give me Fridays off. I'd go to higher power. Then the pandemic hit. And uh, the pandemic hit, lost my job. It was due to laid off. My county job that I was working, you know, it was just getting too stressful. Um, at that time, I was um, in another relationship I was about to get into. Um, and I was staying place to place. She was living in East San Jose. Um, that's the one I'm married to, my wife now. Um, but that uh, led to ups and downs, domestic violence, different things. But it led to, um, you know, me getting into a Samaritan House hotel program. I did that for a while. Um, spent four months in Vagabond in Burlingame. Um, that was an experience. Then went from there to Pacific, uh, no, from there to Rockaway Beach. Spent two months there by the beach. That was a good journey. But it all came down to knowing when I made these right decisions and knowing that this could be the last chance that I get at changing. I had to get it like like I, I keep going on. I had to get a supporting cast. I had to start going to these meetings, started having to make suggestions because I, I just could not continue saying, hey, I can do it Duncan's way. I can do it this way. Oh, well, if I don't do any of these, I, well, I got God, you know, or somebody's keeping me alive. But I knew sooner or later if I did not make a change, something was gonna, I was either gonna go off the wall, drink again, use again. So I had to make that change. You know, when I was getting my recovery, I was so proud, I was so proud of it because, you know, I started reaching out to my dad and telling my dad about my life change. He was so proud of me. We were able to catch up on some time. You know, he talked about some of the things, um, <clears throat> you know, he says, I wish I was there more for you. And we were able to make amends. Um, I tried to talk to him about, you know, slowing down and drinking. But I knew my dad was fighting a demon that I wish I wish it would have helped him. Um, but it made me stronger in the end. I was just glad that we were able to make amends for everything that we went through. It was sad that I couldn't be out there longer. But um, yeah, my dad died of the alcohol disease. And then from there, um, I, we had a great visit, came out, was able to see his birthday. Then I flew out back and uh, was staying with my buddy Sage for a while on and off sage to being on the streets and then um, I was sitting in um, after we got the Chrysler I was sitting in there um, just smoking weed and I got a phone call from my brother and he said hey um, May 5th um, it's been like two years now I'm gonna go on almost three years and my dad's been gone um, I got the call and uh, I didn't expect it you know uh, my dad had a second fall broke six ribs internal bleeding and passed away due to alcoholism so everything hit me my friend was scared like I was gonna punch him or whatever just everything dropped everything just stopped just right there and I thought to myself well there's Safeway right here there's Walgreens I could just run in there and just drink and just go back to the same old shit you know but I had a lot of time I had a lot of time off of meth and I had a lot of time off of drinking and I thought to myself would be this be the way to go, you know? And I, I really did walk in there and I was looking at all the bottles shaking my hands. I said, hey, well, how would this turn? This would turn out to grab all these bottles, grab this and probably end up being killed by the police because I wouldn't have stopped. I, would have, I didn't have anything to live for until I got that call from like my mom, you know, saying, you know, your dad was stubborn a little bit, didn't really want to be involved, but I didn't want to hear that. Like I made bo uh, bonds with my dad, so it was good. So we made amends and I didn't want to hear what my mom said. Oh, you know, he didn't want to be around. 
because she didn't understand the struggles that my dad did too. You know, like <clears throat> unless you unless you've been in addiction, that was the one thing like why I had to sit down with both of them. I asked my dad. He still to this day wanted to tell him my his reasons why he left my mom. You know, same with my mom. You know, that's that's what they have to live with. But at least I was able to get peace. But then that really messed with me, you know, it really messed with me because I was like heartless, you know, I was heartless. I didn't have my dad. I felt why, you know, but I knew in my heart, like there was anxious about, you know, wanting to, you know, rival, you know, fight, you know, go back. But I was like, I think to myself, if I go back, the thing that scared me was him dying of the disease. And that's just woke me up and I was how far I've came. I was like, I'm not going to. And that's what having a good supporting cast led me to as how, how far I was going to higher power, all this, how much support I got from that. So I came back, you know, was homeless for a little bit, staying place to place, you know, and then it just continued with uh, throughout the rest of my time, you know, I was homeless, staying place to place <coughs> until, until I just got to the point where I was running out of places. And then that's when it came down to things slowly but surely had to, I just started taking other suggestions. Like I had to take the opportunity um, through my mental health to go into a shelter and, and start making these choices to continue bettering myself. Cause yeah, I just knew the longer I stayed on the streets, like staying place to place, the more that I was gonna end up getting back into my old ways. I just, I knew it, I knew it by myself. So I had to make these decisions. I had to suck up my, my pride and my loyalty and take suggestions from Ricky and everything. Hey, just just try it out. You know, that's all you can do. Like we can take you to a Christian program or you can go to shelter. <clears throat> just try it out. See what you did. So, you know, there was an offer for me to go because <clears throat> of my mental health to Spring Street. So I went to Spring Street, went with my dog. Um, you know, I'm grateful for it. You know, that was an experience, um, up and down, grateful things. <clears throat> Stuck it out for almost three months. It's just got too much for my health and my mental health and my and just ups and downs and feel that that was a moving forward thing. I'm blessed for the stay that I was able to stay there. I just didn't feel that that was where God wanted me to continue staying. I had one opportunity at an apartment there. Um, something didn't didn't fall through. Um, so I just kept kept on believing, you know, believing in God, believing in my supporting group saying, Duncan, you came so far, you know. Been in here at this hotel, then I had to leave this hotel for one day to go to Capri, and then I'm back here, and then it's opened up an opportunity. So you're so close now. Yeah, yeah I'm so your... close so now. How I got old are you out. Now? How old are I'm you? 36 years old. I just 36. turned 36 on March 14th. Okay. And then uh, yeah, it's been a it's been a long journey in recovery, mental yeah. health. And when are you abuse. supposed to move into your new place? I'm supposed to be moving in. Uh, we did a walkthrough last week. Um, it was the expected date to move in to Belmont Apartments on El Camino Real, uh, me and my dog Diesel. Um, there will be set date that it says right now, and I'm, I'm thinking it's gonna be that, is April 17th. I'll be able to get uh, my own apartment. My That's own like a couple of weeks, yeah. A couple of weeks from now, mm -hmm. something like two weeks. That's great. And um, just trying to keep, keep myself straight, continue doing the right things, um, just taking it day by day knowing that I got to find uh, uh, another place to go after this. Yeah. When you go through these journeys, uh, you never know who you meet. It could be strangers and all, but some of these people have done a big impact in my life. They're like, I haven't really had my mom. I had my mom a lot during my life, but through these troubled times, I wish I would have had her a lot more, but I've had people step in, like, like Gloria Brown and like Joan and like Ricky Wade, Street Life Ministries, people that have just been like, you know, Duncan, I might not have been through what you have been through. I have a different story, but ultimately we've all been through it. Like if you sit down with half of these people, I mean, my story might be different like everything, but it all comes down to it. It comes down to recovery, relationship issues. You make something in your life that you make a decision, but you know, it's, it just depends on how you want it to, to come out. Do you want to be on top? And I mean, I have to start realizing like, you know, so I might not, I not, my biggest thing is I might not be able, you know, to be at the level of where everybody else is, but I have to be comfortable with, hey, you know what? I'm gonna be able to have my own little place, you know? I mean, I have to start realizing that's my biggest thing is not comparing myself to my legendary family or big houses and cars. Like I need to just be set with, hey, if this is all I have, 
that's what I have and then be grateful and be thankful for it. Well, thank you so much, Duncan, for meeting with us, sharing your story. And uh, we look forward to following up when you yes. get into your new place. Yeah, thank you guys so much. And I just want everybody out there, um, if they hear my vo uh, my story, just just to just have hope, faith, just get connected with God, and just give give these uh, you know programs, organizations, these people a chance to work with you, and just don't give up. And as you'll see it. It might not come when you want it, but be patient. It'll come together. And God bless.